My name is Will Esther Robertson, and Willie invited me along today because he thought I'd be good at doing this. Um, we're not quite sure what this is, so I'm not quite sure how we reached that conclusion. Um, we agreed it would be a conversation. We don't want a rami, we don't want an argument, but it's not an explosive conversation. It's not just the three of us up here. Uh, but I am delighted to say that we're joined by Sarah Boyack, MSP, and Patrick Harvey, MSP, who will introduce themselves in a minute. Um, but as I was listening to Julie there, I was thinking, given it's that gorgeous day out there, maybe we should imagine that we're really sat out on the pavement with a coffee or a glass of wine, just having the kind of conversation we're really good at having in Scotland about the state of the nation and all of that. But unlike that kind of conversation, we will actually get some of you to chip in at some point. So if people are desperate to say something um, before I've invited contributions, do just stick your hand up and I'll see if I can just do that. But if not, and we reach a point in the conversation where it would be good to hear from you, um, I'll invite you to contribute. What I was thinking on the way through this morning, um, given Julie's comments also, is that we've now had a parliament in Scotland for 14 years. It scares the life out of me to realise it really is 14 years. And since it was established, I've been one of the people saying, why aren't we talking about the kind of Scotland we want now we've got this parliament? And I was as guilty as everybody else of saying that on the pavement cafes and in the pub and round the dinner table, but not doing anything about it. But I think it really is an example of an idea whose time has come. Because I think whatever the view of an individual or a group about the referendum, somehow it has become the catalyst for that conversation. And I'm pleased to say that I've been at loads of conversations on this very subject in all sorts of different groupings. Um, and the one thing I've already learned um, and they're not all groupings that look homogenous, um, let me be very clear, the amount of unanimity there is about how we would recognise a good Scotland and what it would look like. So the point of this afternoon is to say, if there is that degree of unanimity, how do we decide which constitutional settlement might best deliver it? So what we've asked Sarah and Patrick to do is in two or three minutes say why they believe that their preferred option is more likely to deliver the kinds of things that we've been discussing this morning and that I believe people everywhere are discussing. I was in Govan recently with Oxfam and we've got the sunny Govan radio station broadcasting 24-7 to 60,000 people. And their most exciting project at the moment is that everybody that comes into their wee studio in the middle of Govan is asked to be a wee spokesperson and say with a microphone what they think an ideal Scotland would look like. So even at that level, that unanimity is there. So I'll shut up now. And I'll hand over to Sarah first and then to Patrick and uh, we'll hear why you think your preferred option would deliver the best outcome for our ideal Scotland. Okay, well thank you very much and uh, I'm glad that we are here without wine because wine and cameras and politicians are actually not a very good mix. Um, <laughs> might be entertaining but possibly not wise. <laughs> so it's, it's good just to be up here with water. Um, I am somebody who's a committed devolutionist. I grew up believing that we should be devolving power closer to people so that we could exercise power, exercise accountability and have a more open system. But I also grew up um, very passionate about social justice and about making the world a more equal place, about making the world a fairer place, about tackling poverty. So it seems to me that the question of the border um, is as much about what is power for, what do you want to use power and where does power best lie. And for me, power is never going to lie in one institution, and that would be a huge mistake. The whole point of establishing a Scottish Parliament was to try and um, move power from one institution closer to people. Where I am now sitting is I think there are still some powers that we could usefully devolve to the Scottish Parliament, although the Calman Commission has devolved some powers. But I think there's an agenda now that we need to have more of a debate on, which is not just about powers in the Parliament, there's actually powers at the local and community level and about how we have more accountability and more community engagement. Because what we have called community planning in Scotland involves everybody but the community. And I think there's a huge agenda about um, the nature of a lot of our communities. And the things that would drive me in terms of the values of the Scotland, it would be a Scotland that was a more equal Scotland, a Scotland that was a more uh, sustainable Scotland, a Scotland where social justice drove government policies and drove the different political agendas that we all have. And to come back to Esther's first point, that to me, we've, we've opened the parliament, it is a more accessible place, politics is more accessible, um, decision makers can be reached more easily, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the values are different. And I, I would like to see a Scotland where the principles of equality, 
um, social justice drive our political priorities. I would also like to see a Scotland that is more sustainable, and by that I don't mean a, um, in the way that the, the current government sees sustainable economic growth. I think about how we tackle big issues um, that we can't, can't ignore, even though we're in a recession. The issue of climate change um, will define where we go in the future, and I think there's infinitely more we can do about that. And again, that's not about just powers in a Scottish Parliament, that's about powers at the UK level, at the European level, and I believe very strongly at a local level. So my worldview is not that there is a, a magic bullet that if you all voted for independence in 2014, all would be well. I actually think politically power should be uh, spread. It should not be concentrated in one institution. And I think that has been one of the problems in our Scottish Parliament, that it has taken powers to itself. It has not passed them on to the local level. So I think there's a real issue about power. For me, the big issues that a future Scotland has to challenge is fundamentally how we come out of a recession, how we use the resources we have, the people we have, the land we have more effectively, and how we tackle the big issues of climate change, demographic change, and poverty. Because they are the issues that we need to tackle to create a more equal society and a better society. And a, a good Scotland would be a Scotland that understood those issues as things that were what politics was about and what local accountability was about, and that resources would be driven to attempt to tackle those issues. Because climate change isn't going away and we're having to spend more and money, more money um, making our infrastructure more robust. Demographic change in Scotland, there is a particular challenge for us because we have an older population proportionately, um, and poverty. Um, if you look at the social indices and you compare us across Europe, Scotland sits quite comfortably um, on the average. If you go below the average and you ask about people who are more poor or more wealthy, we have a bigger disparity than most other European countries. So my view is that they are the issues that we should be tackling. And we're going to have a robust debate for the next year and a half. I would rather have had a swifter debate on that because I think most people aren't going to change their minds. Those of us who are passionately believers in spreading power both between the UK and Scotland and Scotland and our local communities are not going to change. Those who passionately believe in an independent Scotland are, going to, are not going to change. And the vast majority of everybody else will make their decision when they have to go and vote. And I'm not sure that having a, an extra year and a half to make up our minds is going to help the debate. So that's why I'm quite looking forward to today, because there'll be some things Patrick and I will agree with on, there'll be other things we'll disagree on. But at the end of the day, for me, um, we lose a lot by leaving the UK and we gain a lot by being part of the UK. We spread the resources, we spread our capacity um, to look after ourselves in tough times, and we spread the wealth in good terms. Um, and I think the, the social justice, the climate change, economic prosperity issues are the things that should drive a better Scotland and a good Scotland. And they are not just about where powers lie, they're fundamentally about what you use power for and who is involved in the exercise of power, and that's not a question of the border to me. Thank you. Thank you. I did ask before we started because we could hear it when Julie was speaking, but I was told it was. Uh -huh, I thought it was. Thank you for, thank you for telling us that. Right. Okay. So you and I will share. Patrick. Okay. Well, hopefully you can hear me buzz free. Is that okay? Fantastic. Um, I suppose just to uh, respond first of all to, to one or two points that Sarah made. I'm probably not someone who is kind of enthusiastically and in my heart a passionate yes voter. I'm someone who I feel quite calmly a yes voter. Uh, I'm on the advisory board of Yes Scotland, but uh, I'm not someone who would pretend that voting yes next year will solve the problem or will create some sort of uh, utopia. I, I think people who are honest about this debate on both sides ought to recognise that voting yes or voting no, neither one offers uh, a utopia or a disaster. 
neither one is all risk or all opportunity. Both carry risks and opportunities. And we need to make a judgment, each of us, about the balance of risks and opportunities. And each time I reevaluate uh, how I feel about this question, I come down on the side that sees more opportunity than risk from a yes vote. Uh, and uh, a great deal less opportunity to do the things that we've been talking about today from a no vote. Having said that, I feel frequently enough pissed off at being accused of supporting Alex Salmond's policies simply because I vote yes, that I will never accuse people who are intending to vote no, who are on the, on the left of politics, I will never accuse them of supporting David Cameron's policies. Voting no doesn't bind you to David Cameron's policies any more than voting yes binds you to Alex Salmond's. I'm much more interested in what scope there is for a debate between people who share many of the values that we've been talking about today. What scope is there for finding the common ground, for finding people who are at least as concerned about using this debate to shift our political culture and the centre of our political culture, at least as concerned about that as we are about getting the result we prefer from the referendum. I want a yes vote and I want to change our political culture and I think I have a great deal in common with people who want a no vote and who want to shift our political culture in the same direction. But a great deal of what we've heard about earlier today and what we've discussed has to do with things we simply cannot do at the moment. And I don't just mean at a technical level. Taxation, welfare, business regulation, many of the things that we said we would like to do differently, at a technical level, we can't do them. And that's one problem, but it's only one part of a problem. Because I don't want merely technocratic solutions, even to the problems that Sarah articulated, like climate change. A technocratic solution, a technical solution that keeps us fixated on CO2 parts per million or annual targets, which clearly we don't have the policies in place to achieve at the moment. I think that's going to leave politicians dealing with issues like climate change or poverty and inequality. It's going to leave us dealing with those problems within the context of the rules that the markets lay down, rather than the rules that the public decides through the democratic process. The thing that I think we need beyond technical powers is the ability to articulate those values, to actually put in place something that only a, a single demos, if you, if you like, a political culture which is autonomous, only an autonomous political culture is able to put these values into practice. So that connects climate change to issues of consumerism. It connects issues of taxation to ownership. It connects the, the local to the global, absolutely, but it, it means that we have the ability to put values fully into practice, rather than only within constraints that somebody else defines for us. So that's why I tend to be on the yes side of the debate, but it's also, I hope, uh, clearly saying why I find a great deal in common and want to find more in common with people who are on the left of the no side. Because the referendum itself, whatever result you want, and whatever result the people choose, the referendum will be one day. And then what happens? Then how does our political culture continue to change? And how do the conversations that we have between now and September 2014, how do they lay the groundwork for a stronger movement for changing our political culture in whichever scenario the people choose to give us. I know which vote I'll be asking for on the 18th of September, but it's at least as important what we do on the 19th, the 20th, the 21st, uh, and the, all of the Septembers that come after it. Uh, and we need to be able to do that in a way that brings people like this together, even though some of us will be happy about the results and some of us less so. Hi, and it doesn't surprise me that in such a short time we're immediately talking about values, um, which is really what this morning's debate's been about. 
how do you believe we can get that debate out into the public rather than the hammering of the two sides against each other with all the scaremongering that we're currently getting? Because I see the two of you absolutely having probably more in common than divides you um, once you take out the constitutional issues. So do either of you know what we can do, perhaps, and what you can do to change the tenor of the debate and get us into this kind of discussion publicly? Well, I, I mean, I could have talked about all the risks of separation, which I, I do passionately believe in as well. Um, but I know today is about the good society, so I was thinking about the other things I wanted to add onto the agenda. I mean, I think the point that Chris made at the start about um, you know, the, the challenge of uh, social justice in Liverpool and Manchester is a similar challenge to what's happening in Glasgow and how our cities are robust and how our cities can invest through a, a recession. So I don't regard the downside and the risks as scaremongering. I, I do believe that things like pensions are better off at a UK level. So we have to find the capacity to disagree with each other uh -huh. without actually obscuring all the other things. And I think for me it's about well, what, what should we be doing now? That, that's the, the issue for me is there is no reason for us not to be talking now about um, local investment, about housing policy, about how we should be doing different things with the powers Scotland currently has. Because the, the examples that, that Patrick gave on things like welfare, um, there are things we could do in the Scottish Parliament on the bedroom tax, for example, that would change council um, choices. The petition that Mike Daly has up to change the law would, would give councillors the ability not to evict anyone legally because they'd incurred a debt as a result of the bedroom tax. Um, we could also be putting in marginally more money that would help councillors make different choices. And if we put more money into housing, we'd start to tackle the problem that lies at the root of a totally unjust social policy that is an incompetent policy because Scotland is not full of one bedroom houses waiting for people to be moved into because we have socially taken the decision over the last 20 years that we think even single people could have the right to a small extra bedroom. And a lot of those extra bedrooms don't have space for two beds, incidentally, for kids. There's only room for a single bed. So I think those are the kind of issues in terms of a good Scotland. I don't want to delay this debate until um, next autumn. That's a debate we could be having now about issues that are affecting people at the moment. It's not just about the future issues, it's about what Scotland we want now as well. Yeah, I mean, we, we certainly need to um, try and take the values and the ideas and the, the aspirations that we've talked about today into other debates, including into very live, immediate campaigns such as the one uh, on the bedroom tax or the various campaigns around the country on the, the bedroom tax. And you're absolutely right that there are things that we can and should be doing right now uh, and things that, that have been done which make it harder, actually, for local authorities to do what they could be doing. Telling local authorities how much taxation they're allowed to raise, for example, having the central government do that. And you talked about local empowerment as part of the constitutional debate. There are many other European countries where it would be unconstitutional for a finance minister to tell local government how much taxation they're allowed to raise. That would give them the ability uh, to, to meet the shortfall because simply not having evictions in the bedroom tax. I don't think we are going to see a wave of evictions. What we're going to see is people pushed further into poverty uh, without being uh, necessarily evicted. Um, so th there, are, there are things that we can do right now. You could add a, an extra top band on the council tax, even if you don't want to get into braver forms of local government finance reform. You could add a top band on the council tax that would generate that extra revenue uh, and that would, that would close the, the, the immediate financial gap. But there's, there's so much else that we can't do at the moment. There are, there are limits to what we can do uh, in, in terms of the, the, the wider attack on not just particular benefits and not just the relationship between those who are accused of scrounging. Uh, you know, unlike KPMG, for example, when they take taxpayers' money to set up a tax avoidance centre in Glasgow, they're called wealth creators. Uh, they're actually some of the biggest corporate uh, benefit scroungers that there are are, are these uh, grant recipients in the private sector. <laughs> but we, need a, we need a way of reconnecting this sense that everybody participates in society. 
in whether we call it a welfare state, whether we call it social security, whether we call it citizen's income or dividend, some of these ideas about language that came up earlier, it needs to reinforce the idea that everybody contributes and everybody receives. And if you, that, that there is you know, a dependency culture. We should be proud of the things that, that uh, where we're dependent on one another, when we rely on one another, because every single one of us does. The, the, you know, the, the millionaire still is dependent on the things that the rest of society contributes to make their life livable, uh, to have an educated, healthy population, uh, to have a, a, a workforce that can treat them when they're uh, you know, uh, ill, when everybody is dependent. And that's something that's actually very human, very natural about human life, to be dependent on one another and to be mutually supportive. I don't think we're able to design a system that articulates those values and puts them into practice uh, simply by ameliorating the harm of the bedroom tax. It's not enough. Um, sorry, I think that's come to the end of one round, sorry. <laughs> Before I call on the audience, can I pick up on something you've both said, um, which actually in much of the discussion I've been having in all these other contexts is maybe at the heart of it all. <coughs> Excuse me. Whether we have an independent parliament or a devolved parliament in two years' time, if that parliament doesn't itself decide to start devolving more of its power, then nothing will change. Mm -hmm. Do you see any encouraging signs in our existing system that the parliament is beginning to think about that as an issue? Because it's very much an issue that we're hearing about out in, in the wider society. Mm -hmm. Think about that one. At present, no. <coughs> uh, the, the short answer would be no. Um, Part of this is the fact that the referendum is coming and it's, although it opens up the possibility of debating these things, it makes it very, very hard to actually do them because the Scottish Government is focused on winning the referendum, other political parties, other larger political parties are focused on uh, winning it from their perspective. It's very hard to see other radical policies starting to come through mm. in that context. It's also, and this isn't about the SNP specifically, it's also partly about having a single party dominating with a, a single party majority. Now, if that was any other party, I think the same problem would arise. Having a single chamber where one party has a single party majority. Even during the first eight years when there was a coalition, there was a dynamic between those two parties and there was an ability to debate issues which maybe weren't part of the programme for government but it was, there was a, a, a different dynamic that, was, that left ministers a bit more accountable. Having a single chamber with a single party majority means that it's very, very hard to get any issue onto the agenda or, or for parliament and its committees to respond to them if it doesn't have the support of the ministers, of the, of the leadership of the dominant party. Uh, that wasn't true under coalition. It wasn't true under minority government, which uh, was, was my preferred session, not just because there were very few of us and we got some influence, but because everybody was able to exercise influence if they simply approached the debate properly. So uh, I am optimistic that after the referendum, after this, uh, this blockage has, has passed, um, whichever result it is, uh, that we can, we can then go forward and it, it will take, whichever side loses, it will take some time to get over the shock and to start to reform where they are and what they want to do next but I think that, that opportunity will open up. Um, yeah, I'd agree with Patrick about the centralisation issue. I think um, it, it wasn't expected actually the extent to which um, certain powers have become more centralised under the last, uh, particularly the last, the last few years. And when you look back at how, I should have introduced myself, I'm Labour's spokesperson on local government at the moment, so I spend all my time thinking about how you would make local government um, more robust in terms of its capacity to deal with the difficult things that's coming down the track, because um, we've lost about 35,000 local government employees in the last two years because of the squeeze on their funding, and that's before you see the big impact of the austerity cuts coming through. So I'm constantly trying to think about how you can look at that issue about taxation, which is not just about council tax, because we will have a freeze for the next um, four years. It's what it's what other opportunities are there to make it possible for local services to be sustainable and high quality. 
but I think there is a centralisation. I think Patrick's point about shared power, power are quite interesting, because if you think back to the demand for a Scottish Parliament, there was a historic deal done, effectively, um, by the Labour Party saying we will move from our preferred uh, voting system, which is first past the post, which suited us, because we got most seats, <laughs> because first past the post, and we moved to a PR system. Um, now I've, I've actually always been, I've, not been, I've never been enthusiastic for PR, I just think it's probably the right thing to do. And I do think having a different electoral system has made people share power, because Patrick's right, in the first eight years, um, I, think, I think different parties have different cultures. I think the SNP at the moment is a phenomenally self-disciplined party. Um, because they have the vote coming up in a year and a half, so that nobody wants to be the backbencher in the SNP who lost in a referendum. Whereas my own party just doesn't work like that. I've been a minister and a backbencher, and we don't apply by that kind of rule that the person in charge is always right. Um, not until you've had several debates with them and pushed them to the limit and tried to change them. So I think there are different cultural things, but having to win a majority um, when you don't start off with the majority does change politics. Um, and even speaking to people who, who weren't part of that coalition in the first eight years, Robin Harper, for example, used to get lots of stuff through, even there was only one of them, because he'd just pick his topics and he would make an argument that, that what was being proposed wasn't good enough, and he quite often won the argument. So I think there is an issue about how the institution works, and shared power is important, um, and you can see that at the local government level. Um, but it's... It, Having, having shared power, you have to have a political uh, willingness to do that, and I don't think it's currently there at the moment. So that, that's why opening up those kind of issues, I think, about bedroom tax, about the values and culture that we have in Scotland, and asking difficult questions about tax and how tax is currently spent. These are fundamental issues. If you want to create a better and a good Scotland, those have to be part of our discussion before, during, and after the referendum because they are about the day-to-day -day decisions that determine whether or not we can attack poverty and whether we can create that better Scotland. And for all that Scotland is a wonderful place, if you look at, um, if you look at some of the geographical areas of Scotland, we have huge poverty that we are just ignoring at the moment. And that, that is not gonna let us create a good Scotland because those people's talents are being wasted and those communities um, it's quite striking, you're much more likely to go to accident and emergency, um, have connections with drugs and alcohol, it doesn't mean you're on them, but it might mean your neighbours are on them, um, have poor quality housing and live in fuel poverty, and it's geographically determined, and we've got to crack that. And I, I think a politics which um, says that there's a, a change to the constitution will fix that isn't right. There are things we can be doing now. Um, I'm part of the Labour Party's um, devolution commission as of a couple of weeks ago and one of the discussions we put out for consultation um, is that we think that income tax should be devolved. We understand there is a desire for more accountability and more control over the powers in the parliament and we're putting that out for consultation at the moment. We don't think corporation tax or national insurance should be devolved because we think there's an issue about um, being able to spread wealth across the UK and avoiding a race to the bottom. And on national insurance, we think having a social security system that um, sees you through wherever you are in the country is important. So there, there are things we think do bind us together in terms of a social union, but um, even though we are not in favour of independence, it doesn't mean we're not seeing the argument for further devolution. Well, before I invite contributions or questions from the audience, I think I would have to say two things. I suppose I should have fessed up about my background too, because I was coordinator of the Constitutional Convention and then went on to serve on the steering group that wrote the standing orders for the Parliament. And when I go back to my convention days, I did literally hundreds of presentations. Um, I've still got the slideshow at home that says this is what it will look like, this is the voting system, this is how the list system will work, etc., etc. If there were two things that I was most commonly held to task about in those presentations, one was, will this produce a representative parliament? And of course, we thought we designed a system that would never allow a majority government. And we got proved wrong. And I got lots of angry emails from friends, I'll tell you, after the last election saying, you said this couldn't happen. <laughs> but the other thing we thought we had designed, and it didn't work in the longer term, I hope it will return, 
was that it would create space for the smaller parties and independents. And when we think how well we did at one point in terms of a spread of representation, but we are now back into that kind of more polarised. But the other issue was we signed up as a convention to subsidiarity, and I spent my life explaining what I thought was a really straightforward concept, which was that once Parliament got from Westminster to Edinburgh, Edinburgh would start to push it further down the line. And of course, 14 years on, we're nowhere near there. And I think for me, that's certainly a big issue. And I'm still struggling with this question of will it be any different whether you know next year we're an independent parliament or still a parliament within the UK? But I think that's a whole other debate. Anyway, I don't know what we're doing about microphones, Willie, but you know, if people want to contribute, do you need one of these? Lots of people. So that's not going to be a challenge. We only yeah, we'll need to keep one so that we can respond. So can I take the gentleman at that table? I uh, just wanted to sorry. Sorry? My name is Craig Lundy. Um, sorry. Go back to my other name. Sorry. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to look at uh, an example that you brought up uh, about what's happening in, in uh, politics just now. Uh, there's a lot of feeling and uh, sort of manoeuvring going around about something that's happened that's called the bedroom tax. Yeah. Uh, just a very, very brief potted history of the, of the bedroom tax. A couple of years uh, before this government came into power, uh, or well, so shortly before this government came into power, the Labour Party introduced a, a new reform uh, whereby people in private tenancies should not be allowed uh, to, to, to get housing benefit for an additional room where they stay. That's when it started. Okay? After that, what we had was uh, not an awful lot of resistance, funnily enough, because this is what happened when the Labour Party brings something in, you shrug your shoulders, where can you go? when it's Westminster. But then the Tories came along and, and, and scored the open goal that was there, you know, well, if, you, if that's for private tenancies, well, surely for, uh, for social housing, it should be the same rule, you know, we're only being fair to the taxpayer, you know? And of course, then you start to get some resistance because it, it clearly isn't fair, but it wasn't fair in the first place it was, uh, when, when it was for private tenants. But I, I believe the Labour Party probably brought this in uh, because they were under pressure from some people, you know, genuinely progressive people who were saying, look, housing benefit. Can we bring in the gentleman with the brown shirt and then I'll come over this side. Oh. Yeah, so I'm uh, Stuart Darling here. Thanks for the, the conversation there. It's been a, a good day and I think everyone here has a, a common will towards a fairer and more equal society. So I just wanted to touch on a couple of points related to the, the referendum that I think hit on that. First of all, I think Trident actually really effectively captures the debate 
We're talking about a potential £100 billion pounds worth of British taxpayers' cash being used for weapons of mass destruction, which will be situated just a little bit down the road in the Clyde. And we effectively have the opportunity to stop that by voting yes, that that spend on the next generation system is not going to happen. So I think that touches on a fair and equal society uh, and, and a good world for Scotland, for the UK, by stopping the, uh, the, the spend on, on that from everyone's, everyone's tax, and also for the, for the greater world. So it's actually, it's a, it's a world decision that we're in effect making here, and an opportunity uh, to take that. And then, ne next point on the sustainable Scotland, or the sustainable um, economy opportunity that we have. Just now, on, on equality and on fairness, Westminster is, has been on a path, to the, I was born in 1980, and for the entirety of my life, the path has been away from equality, and away from fairness. And so I don't feel that we're, we're really getting that. We've got an economy that's overly weighted on the city and on oil and gas, which is in fact is the sector that I work in myself, which is a fantastic sector, but we are, it is the biggest in industry in the UK right now. And many people in Scotland are, are quite oblivious to, to the size and the scale of the economy. And they say that if we go into an independent Scotland, We'll be putting all our eggs in one basket. Actually, what the process that would be enabled through independence is to start taking the eggs out of that basket and to diversify the economy based on the wealth that exists right now. And that's the opportunity that we have. And I think, really, I hope, I hope Sarah and, and others who are involved uh, currently on the no side see the next 15 months as the opportunity to listen to the opportunities that we have and potentially change, change your mind and change your heart. Gentlemen, there are gentlemen. We ought to go that one first to see if you're running across the room, Willie, and then we'll come back to this table. We've got a line on the table here, obviously.
sin by struggle and justice and bonding or basketball with our class headaches. I want you to be in solidarity with the class, uh, with the, the working class across the globe in an international sense. Uh, why do we need to, to remain in full unity with, uh, uh, with England on this? Uh, I believe that if Scotland becomes independent, it will liberate both Scots and the English um, to shed their current insular perspective and become far more internationalist in their outlook. Thank you. I'm conscious of the time here on. So can we take the question from, I think it's Sarah, and then I'll ask the panellists to respond to this. I mean, I think the stuff that Caroline Flint is articulating about how we do control um, the big six power companies is a very practical way to begin to control what is a, a free market in electricity. Um, but I think the other side of that is there's still a lot more we could be doing in Scotland in terms of inefficient housing. Um, the delay on private rented um, accommodation being brought up to spec, um, I just don't see why we would want to delay that. Um, I mean, it comes back to the earlier questions about private rented accommodation. The reason we've got lots of people renting flats now is because there's a, a generation of people that now own properties and are renting it out to people. It's not good quality flats. We have to put legislation through the Parliament to um, secure people's deposits so they get them back again. But I think there is an issue about um, we have a fundamental lack of housing in Scotland. I mean, there are some empty properties, and I certainly supported legislation to tax that, those properties at a higher level, but we have a fundamental lack of housing, and there's a massive social inequality, and there's a generational inequality, because there are young people now who will have to save something like £25,000 before they'll get access to getting a mortgage, and that is a huge amount of money for people to save up when they're having to pay high rents. So I do think there is an issue which we could tackle now about building housing, and that is part of the that is part of a way to create a better Scotland in terms of generating opportunities and training for young people. It is not something we need to wait about to do. We could be doing that now, and I think there is there is a broad coalition in Scotland from shelter, trade unions to talk about prioritising housing investment. It is one of the fastest ways we could get people back to work, but also tackle social justice and get our economy going in a good way. Um, and part of that agenda could be linked into renewables, um, because one of, my, one of my observations would be that the system we have for extending electricity cabling is funded on a UK basis. If you separate that, we would spend a lot more in Scotland because we are um, more diverse in terms of where our big renewables are coming from. But I would also like to see more community-owned renewables. And in terms of a good Scotland, I'll give you an example just in my own area in Edinburgh where one of the relatively affluent villages has been given a 25-year lease on one of our local waters. That community is setting up a cooperative which will fund investment in that local community and it's done as a community good and I think there's a lot more we could be doing in terms of local energy. It, it's just not happening in Scotland at all and actually ironically it is happening in some of the big English cities like Birmingham and Newcastle where they are doing municipal investment in energy. It will bring prices down and will also give people 
a relief from fuel poverty. It's partly about insulating houses, but it also is about producing electricity and renewable heat that people will get a benefit from, benefit from locally. And I think they're very practical things that we could be doing now. Um, the issue about equality and fairness, I, I mean, I think we have to try and keep these things on the agenda. And there are two, there are three levels of government happening in Scotland at the moment. There's the UK government, there's the Scottish government, and there's the local government. And at all of those levels, we need to be having this kind of debate. And it's, it's not happening. And I, I think uh, groups like yourselves um, engaging with us, lobbying different groups in the parliament, doing the kind of networking is really important because the, the comment that somebody made, made about our society is an Anglo-American driven society, I, I think that is, that's certainly true historically. I do think um, the UK looks much more in Europe as well and that will be a huge battleground over the next two years. And having gone out in the streets, you can't make the assumption um, that everybody has signed up to that project. And I think there's a real debate to be had about what we get out of being part of the European Union. I think being part of Europe has been a very good thing for us, but the fact that there's a possibility of a UK referendum um, means that that needs to come into our debate about equality, because um, for Scotland, being part of the UK, we are also part of Europe, and I think we want to retain that. And, and it, it links to the question I think Nikki made about um, how we tackle power. I think campaigns like the F campaign and make Poverty History campaign highlight the fact that it's, it's not just the City of London cannot just be controlled within the, the UK, it has to be a, a more global um, movement for change and for accountability and for social responsibility in banking. And our contribution in Scotland is that we had some of the major banks in Scotland and we didn't ask some of those tough questions of our own banks. So I think we, we have to look to ourselves as well as looking to the, the debate about independence about banking issues. Yeah, I'm going to begin uh, where, I, where I began in the, the, the first contribution uh, that I made, which is that voting yes, voting no, uh, these don't give guarantees. These should be about opening up possibilities. And so the, the point that was made about Trident, for example, voting yes doesn't guarantee that we'll get rid of Trident and that we won't spend that money on Trident. Voting yes offers the possibility, it opens up the possibility that we can do that. We might end up with an elected government in Hollywood that's willing to cut a deal. Now, I, would, I find that a horrific possibility, but it is a possibility. Voting yes opens up the possibility that we can do something different in Scotland than is being done uh, at UK level. It doesn't give a guarantee. But I think both sides need to be focused, uh, the yes and the no side need to be focused on how they can open up. How does their offer open up new possibilities for Scotland to do things differently, either with existing powers or with uh, additional powers that would come with independence. The, the, the energy uh, example is, is another one. There are clearly things that we can't do on energy right now, but there are also things that we could be doing if local authorities were building their own local energy companies, as used to happen, it's not a new idea, they could be investing in the housing stock. They could be investing uh, in renewable energy generation, not just to meet climate targets, not just to meet national targets, but actually to generate revenue that central government couldn't then take away with a stroke of a pen. Uh, in my view, that agenda makes sense if you then join the dots and turn it into a national energy company, uh, and I think we could only do that with the powers of independence. But the, the steps with the powers that we can take right now aren't... Uh, being taken. I think there's this question about marketised power, the, democrat, the power that's supposed to be democratically accountable in our society has been handed to the private sector, handed to the markets. Can this change? Can it change either within the UK or within Scotland? And some of it is global precisely because it's been made unaccountable. It's been handed from democratically accountable governments to unaccountable market systems. Well, I don't know. I don't know if we can change it. The, the one thing that I do know is that if we don't try, we'll fail. Uh, and I think we, that we have to, we have to make the effort. And it, it comes down to this, this issue about solidarity with other parts of the UK. Yes, we should be absolutely as concerned about poverty and inequality and prejudice 
and selfishness and any other form of social ill in every part of the UK and every part of the world. Every part of the world. But the idea of doing something different, of trying to change and break the stranglehold that the, the right or the centre right, however you want to call it, or neoliberalism has had in our politics, trying to do that even within Scotland is not about floating ourselves apart. It's not about standing apart. It's actually about giving leadership within these islands and actually giving potentially the progressive movement south of the border the kick up the ass that they so clearly need. Or the shot in the arm, let's, let's call it. Because there is a, because a psychological barrier that's every bit as profound, every bit as difficult to get over as the unaccountable power that's being exercised in our society. People don't think better politics is possible. People, people don't believe that a better kind of politics and a good society is possible, or not enough of those people do. And so to demonstrate even within Scotland that something better is possible, demonstratively uh, can give leadership and can help to overcome that um, disillusioned, justifiably disillusioned, uh, tired and, and alienated attitude that says better politics uh, isn't possible. Uh, and finally, I, wanna, I want to say that a, a big part of uh, what that better politics should be about uh, does relate to the, the point the, the chap in the blue shirt over here made about resources and about the finite resources that we face, about the profound challenges that any economy, left or right, any society devolved, independent, uh, part of a union, part, uh, standing on its own, all of us face these profound challenges that we cannot run our societies in the way that we have been running them without causing dramatic suffering around the world and ultimately crashing the systems that our economy depends on. But I think that gives us the opportunity to redefine what people can aspire to. What a good society is, is one that does place human relationships on a higher pedestal than human possessions. And it does place a higher value on the, the relationships between us than on the material goods that we consume uh, and uh, on the, the, the way that, that that kind of narrow metric of, of GDP becomes dominant. And I think if we can break that, then perhaps we've got the chance of having political leaders of any political party or of no political party uh, who don't simply repeat the failings by following the rules that have been laid down uh, over the last 30 years of economic failure. something I heard Willie say, I arrived a wee bit late this morning, I just caught the end of it, um, so I don't know whose quote it was, but he said the bit about if we want to build a ship, don't try and train people in how to go and collect the wood and use the tools, give them the longing. And I think what this debate has shown me, along with all the others, is that actually the longing is absolutely there across Scotland for this kind of debate to achieve this kind of dream that we've all got of this ideal Scotland. Maybe you've just hit it, Patrick, the longing's there, maybe the belief isn't. But hopefully you will all feel today you can take away that belief. I think we all came with the longing. Go away with the belief that it is possible and there are enough people out there with ideas and energy and enthusiasm and commitment across the spectrum. Um, and I'm certainly very optimistic, regardless of what happens next September, that Scotland can move in that direction. I'd like to hand back to Willie and Julie, Julie to conclude the seminar, and thank you very much.